22nd chapter of Luke. I don't have a patriotic sermon this morning. I did wear my only red, white, and blue shirt. How's that? I told several people I, I used to have a, this only red, white, and blue patriotic looking thing I've got. I used to have a shirt that uh, I really liked. It had flags and hot dogs and all, just kind of looked like a July the 4th shirt. I really liked it. And I got looking at it real close one day and realized that mixed in with the flags and hot dogs was beer bottles. And so I had to get rid of that shirt. And so uh, this is all I got left. It's red, white, and blue. So uh, that's my patriotic edition this morning. So uh, Luke chapter 22. We've been looking over the last uh, few weeks at these instances where uh, someone's name is, uh, is mentioned twice. And uh, this morning, uh, I want to look at one that um, is a little bit, um, a little bit difficult. Uh, as uh, I look at them, I can kind of in my mind uh, get an idea of the tone of voice that the name was set in. When, when God called Abraham, I'm sure it was that, you know, that stereotypical voice, we, that booming Abraham, you know, that, you know, that deep you know, voice from heaven. Uh, same with Moses from the burning bush, that deep, you know, pay attention, I'm about to say something important uh, voice. Last week, as uh, I said, I can picture Christ as he spoke to Martha, just kind of Martha, Martha, just kind of shaking his head and, and uh, Martha, you just don't get it. This week, uh, as we look at uh, Simon Peter and Christ says to him, Simon, Simon, um, and, and I, I, I really can't get a, a quite a, a tone in my mind for how uh, this would ha- have sounded, because as um, as you read it, you, you learn that uh, Christ was warning Simon, uh, Christ was encouraging Simon, uh, Christ was warning and encouraging all those around. Uh, Christ was trying to get Simon's attention, uh, and, and so I'm not sure that uh, I know the right tone to, to do all those things. But uh, as we read this passage, uh, we find that uh, the Last Supper has, uh, has just completed. Uh, Christ has just finished uh, having uh, the Last Supper with his disciples. And then he is uh, addressing, uh, in particular, Simon. But uh, the words that um, are used here in, in this passage are, uh, words that make it clear that, um, that, that, he, that, that while he calls Simon by name, uh, the warning was for all the disciples and that he was addressing them and all, but in particular Simon. And I believe the reason for that um, is Simon had emerged as uh, the leader. Uh, he, he was, and, and we know as we continue to read, as we read into Acts, he, he becomes that uh, leader uh, of the new church. And so I think he was specifically uh, warning Simon because he knows uh, that as the leader uh, that he's going to be Satan's target, that Satan is going to be, uh, be after him. And he says to Simon, uh, he says, Simon, uh, Satan ha- has desired to have you. Uh, that doesn't sound too good, but it doesn't sound horrible, Uh, desired to have you um, and desires to to sift you like wheat. Um, Again, two two words that, uh, two statements that one of them because of the language really maybe not as clear to us and one of them because of practice. There's probably uh, very few of us here who have ever sifted wheat. Uh, And he gives Simon that warning and then he gives him uh, a word of encouragement. He says, but Simon, uh, because I know that Satan has desired to have you um, and wants to sift you like wheat, I have prayed for you. Now, I don't know that there could be a uh, more uplifting, encouraging thought uh, to, to have than to have Jesus Christ look at you and say, I'm praying for you. Uh, but then when you stop and put that into context, the reason Jesus says I'm praying for you is because Satan wants to have you. Uh, and, and so I'm praying for you. And, and, and then he says something. He says, I'm praying for you that your faith fails not. And that when you're restored, when you're converted, you'll help the brethren. Uh, and in reading that passage, uh, again, uh, just kind of casually reading across it, we, we miss some of the uh, little nuances of the passage because uh, there, there's a lot being said there that, uh, that unfortunately we might miss 
um, in, in English, that, that we may miss without knowing the traditions, without knowing uh, some of those routines. And uh, what Christ was really saying to Simon, what he's addressing to us, is, is what to do when we fail. Uh, he, he says to Simon, and, and I'll address this a little bit more uh, as we look at the passage, Simon, you're going to fail. Simon, you're, you're about to mess up. We know that he's about to tell, tell Peter that you're going to deny me three times. And, and uh, we know that uh, Peter does eventually do just that. And, and Jesus is, is giving him a, a warning about that. And, and then he gives him a little idea. This is what you do when you fail. Not if you fail, but when you fail. If we were honest, all of us would would admit that in our Christian walk, uh, in our relationship with God, that there are times, there are days, there are moments when we don't quite measure up, when we don't do what we should, uh, when we fail. What what do we do? How do we respond um, to failure? How do do we respond uh, to to mistakes, to blunders, to whatever you choose to call them in in our Christian walk? I think we see that uh, in in this passage. And so this morning, I I want you to to look with me. We're going to see three things here uh, of how to handle failure, how to to deal with with, with, uh, the Christian walk, how to be prepared, how to handle it, how to respond uh, to failure. First thing uh, that is imperative of that that we understand is to understand, first of all, the, the work of Satan. Uh, we, we need to be clear about that. I, one of the things that, uh, that concerns me greatly in, in the church today, in, in Christianity and religion, is that we have um, underestimated Satan. We, uh, again, I've said before, I don't want to get you to the point where you see the booger man behind every door. I, I don't want to get you to the point where you're afraid to go to sleep at night uh, because the devil might be under your bed. Uh, but but I, I do think I'd be doing you a disservice if I didn't point out the fact uh, that Satan is alive and well. Uh, Satan, the Bible says, is, is roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He's described uh, as one whose goal, whose ambition is to, to, to steal, kill, and destroy. That's, that's how Satan is described. And so we need to understand that in, in, the, in, our, in our daily walk, uh, that, that Satan is, is spiritually speaking the one uh, you know, that's sitting there waiting on you to walk by and he's going to stick his foot out. I mean, that's, you know, in, in a mild way, that's, you know, that, that's a, a description of Satan. In your Christian walk, he's the one uh, who's just waiting for the opportunity to kick your feet out from under you because he, that, that's his objective. And so Christ says to Simon here, uh, he says, Simon, Simon. And and again, I've thought about this a lot. Try to get just in my mind that that tone of voice that that Jesus would have used here as a a warning, as as an encouragement, as a caution uh, to get his uh, attention. When he says to him, Satan has desired to have you. Now, uh, you know, I don't think that sounds that good. I, I, I don't think if I looked at any of you and said, uh, I got a message on, there's a message on the phone today, and, and Satan called, and he'd like to have you. You know, most of us would probably go, you know, let him have Tommy. Uh, you know, uh, you know, no, 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 you know uh, no, that doesn't sound good. It, it, it is as bad as it sounds in in uh, in, in, in our modern translation and in, in, in a King James translation and in, in, in our English Bible, uh, it sounds even worse if you know the the Greek language uh, that is used there. I, you know, uh, Satan has desired. To, to have you. Uh, and and what, what the words mean is, uh, is far more dramatic than, than, than have you. Uh, you know, when I think Satan desires to have you, uh, it sounds like maybe Satan wants to put you in a headlock and, you know, put a, put a noogie on your head or something. That's kind of what, uh, you know, ha- Satan having you sounds like. But, but the word that is used there, actually... Uh, a, a better way for you and I to understand it, how Peter would have understood it, uh, was that Christ said, Satan desires to torture you. That, that's the word that, uh, that, that Peter would have understood. That's how Peter would have heard uh, what Christ was saying. Satan desires to, to torture you. Satan desires to 
punish you uh, are, are the ways uh, that is how Simon would have heard that statement. And, and, and immediately, I don't know about you, but if, if I'm ranking it on a scale, Satan desires to have you is you know, probably right about here on the scale. Satan desires to torture you you know, we, we've dramatically elevated the language. We've, we've dramatically elevated the, the impression. And, and, and we need to understand that in, in our daily walk uh, with Christ. We need to understand uh, and constantly beware uh, lest we fail. Uh, lest we disappoint, lest we fall into temptation as the Bible describes it. Because Satan desires to torture you. Satan desires to, to torment you. Now, I, I'll have to admit, I have been that person, probably like uh, many of you here, that, you know, sitting in your desk at school, when, you know, you're sitting there, somebody gets up to go up front to ask the teacher a question, they walk by, you stuck your foot out, and, and, and you wanted to see them stumble and trip and fall, but, you know, didn't want to see them break their arm, you know. You know, most of the time, you know, didn't want to see them, you know, bleeding or anything. Just wanted to see them stumble and and be embarrassed. Well, Jesus says to Simon, Satan doesn't just want to see you stumble. Satan doesn't just want to see you embarrassed. Satan wants to to torture you. Satan wants to kick you while you're down. Satan wants to destroy your life. Again, the Bible says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You, you don't have to, to look those words up. You don't have to study their, their meaning. You don't have to get out your lexicon and, and, and your Strong's Concordance and, and your Bible dictionary to understand steal, kill, and destroy. If I was to tell you this morning that, Kevin, somebody's coming over to your house to steal, Pansy, somebody's coming to your house to kill. Jew, somebody's coming to your house to destroy. All three of you'd get up and go home. You, you'd go do what, you know, you'd go, you know, load the guns. You'd go call the law. Because steal, kill, and destroy, man, we're talking serious business. Roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. I don't know about you. You ever had one of those little little rugrat dogs? They, you know, they want to nip at your shoe and, and, and gnaw on it. It's kind of an aggravation, but you know, it's not the end of the world. You know, uh, you, you got a Doberman or a pit bull or something, and they come along. Now we got a little serious, a little, little more, a little more serious uh, uh, offense. You know. And the Bible says of Satan, and Jesus says to Simon here, he says, Satan is desiring to, to have you, to torture you. Now, torture, again, is something that, that most of us, you know, torture for most of us is, you know, going to a restaurant that serves Pepsi and we wanted a Coke. Oh, no. You know, now, that's torture for a lot of us, you know. Torture, the, the, the air condition isn't running right, or torture, traffic's bad. We go back and we read some of the stories of some of our POWs and, and, and some of our, uh, our, our veterans. They, they've been tortured. You know, we, we read of the, the kinds of things that were done in, in, in the battlefields. We understand torture even if we haven't been tortured. And God says to Simon, he wants to torture you. Think about that for a moment. When we go about our, why should, what, what, what do we do in our daily walk? What do we do in our relationship with God? Simon, you be careful. Satan wants to, to torture you. Satan, Satan wants to, to, to torment you. He wants to punish you. He, he wants to, to ruin your life. Have you, have you seen some of these folks who, 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 who preachers, Christians, noted Christians, who, because of failure in their life, their, their life is destroyed. Their, their life is ruined. Their, their ministry is taken from them. Their, their family is taken from them. Not just, not just a little Satan wants to have you. Satan wants to, to embarrass you. Satan wants to torture and torment and, and punish you. Not, nothing would, would please Satan any more than to have a, a Christian businessman whose picture was on the front page of the paper and, and the headlines, embezzlement, or, or, or something along those lines. He, he doesn't just want to mess, mess up a few things. Will you? Simon, he wants to torture you. And then he goes on and he gives an illustration that, 
that, that you and I today, we, we may not really be able to, to wrap our heads around that well. When, when he says to him and he says he wants to torture you and he, and he wants to do it by sifting you like wheat. Now, there may be a few of you here because of, uh, of age or experience or where you grew up. You, you may understand that image. But for most of us, when we understand flour, we've been to the store and bought a bag of a Red Band or Pillsbury or something. Yeah, that, that, that's what we think of when we come home and we rip open the bag and we dump it in the container, whatever we keep our flour in, and we get a measuring cup and we scoop out some flour and we go to it. Yeah, we, we make what we need to make because our, our flour comes pre-milled. It's, you know, it's already ground. It's, it's already clean. You know, it's ready to go. And, and, and so we just dump it out the bag and bake away. But Peter would have understood and his audience there would have understood things a little bit different. See, I, I don't know exactly when Pillsbury came into existence, but I know they're not mentioned in the Bible. Um, and, and so they didn't have the opportunity to buy enriched, and I don't know what all them words are on the flower bag anymore. It means they've been messing with it too much. Uh, enriched and all that stuff. Many times when, when they would buy what they would have bought for flour, many times it had been milled some, but it wasn't milled completely. And so there would still be grain in the flour, in the wheat, that needed to be milled some more to make flour. Many times there would be something there that wasn't grain. They might have picked the morning glory along with the grain. And you had to get, you know, that stuff out of there because that's not grain for flour. Many times there would be gravel and dirt. And so when they were sifting, they were going through and separating good from bad and and, and, and going through, and, and, and they weren't, you know, when I think of sifting today, I, I think of that thing, you know, I don't know what, what y'all's looks like. We got one of them things, got a handle on it, a crank out here, you put some flour in it, and, you know, and, you know you're really not doing anything. I, I, I don't really know what you're doing, to be honest with you. You know, you, you're knocking the lumps out of it. You're not really doing much. When they sifted grain, when they sifted their flour, they were literally, they were sometimes pulling out the good from the bad. And, and, and distinguishing. And, and the image that, that, that Jesus is giving to Simon here is that Satan will go, is desiring to go in, and, and sometimes I think we look at this and think, like when, when we sift flour, we think of the idea of going through and, and sifting out and getting out the lumps to throw away so we've got good flour left. I don't know about you, I sift it just because I like the way it looks when I get done. I don't know that it does anything. I just think it looks better once I've run it through that little doohickey. You know, I, I, you know, I just like the way it piles up. In an, I, just, I just like to sift flour. You know, if you've got flour you want to sift it, call me. Uh, you know, I, I, I just like, but the, the, the picture here that, that God, that Christ is giving Simon, it, it, again, that, that rough wheat, and, and that he's sifting out to find the bad. I believe, I believe that's the image that Christ is trying to get Simon to understand. I mean, when Simon sifts you, or when Satan sifts you, he, he's not trying to find the good. He's trying to find the bad. And he's wanting to find that bad and put it to work. You know, I, I hear people sometimes talk about, you know, if, if somebody, a great big old guy's picking on a little fellow, they'll tell him, pick on somebody your own size. Why? Somebody your own size might whoop you. You know, somebody littler than you might whoop you, but, you know, I like my odds a lot better. You know, if, if, you know, if somebody's got a, a, a bum knee, kick them in the bum knee. You know, that's, you know, I found out a while ago, Barbara's left eye is not, I, she, I said, I need to know that. She told me her left eye, she couldn't see good eyes. I said, so you're a sucker for a right hook, right? I need to know that. You know, you never know. You know, you, you need to know. Find the weakness. Go for the weakness. Right? Why? You, you, if you had a military commander and, and, and the, the, his enemy had all his tanks and weaponry over here, wouldn't be too smart to go attack where the tanks and the weaponry are. You go over here where there are no tanks, right? Well, that's the image that Christ has given to Simon. Christ, beware. Simon, Satan knows your weaknesses better than you do. 
See, I, I've shared before, poor illustration, I know, but you know, how many of you are tempted to break your diet? Yeah. And I've told you, Satan can tempt me with a lot of things, but he'll never tempt me with pickled beets. You could throw me in a swimming pool of pickled beets, and I would drown before I eat my way out. You know, I, I just ain't happening, and things are disgusting. They're, 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 they're vulgar. Yeah. That, you, know, you want to talk about torture? Yeah. You can have mine. You know, uh, you, know you can have mine. You know, th you know, that's just vulgar. Satan knows. Simon, Satan knows where to tempt you. Satan knows where your weakness is, Kevin. He knows. He may never tempt you with being rich because he knows maybe you've gotten used to not being rich and don't care anymore. You know, he knows you gave up the dream of ever having money when you married Melissa. You know, he, you know, he, he, you know, he, he may never tempt Tommy with, 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 with pride and, and being famous. Cause, you know, he, but he may tempt him with something else. Simon, Satan wants to torture you, and he knows how to do it. He knows where your weakness is. So what does Jesus say to us in light of that statement? What does he say to Simon? He looks at Simon and says, Simon, Satan wants to torture you, and he knows just how to do it. I can think of a lot of ways I would like to hear Jesus respond. And I, don't get mad, I'm not rewriting the Bible. I'm just being honest with you this morning. If, if Christ looked at me and said, Jimmy, Satan wants to torture you and he knows just how to do it, I'd like to hear Jesus say, but I punched him in the throat so he can't do it. Yeah, but, but I knocked him down. I told him he couldn't. I put a fence around you. It's not a pretty good response to me. You know, I told him absolutely not. Simon, Satan wants to torture you and he knows just how to do it. And I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. You hear what Jesus says? Jesus does, let, let's say what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, but Simon, it'll be all right because I got you back. He doesn't say, but Simon, don't worry about it because I slapped him down. He says, Simon, I prayed for you. That sounds good. But look what he says. I prayed that your faith not fail, that you not be utterly destroyed, that you don't renounce the faith, that you don't walk away from God. And then look what he says. And he says, when you are Converted. Now that word "converted" in in, in it, it, it doesn't. We think of conversion in in the church today as someone being saved. He's not saying to Peter, "When you're saved." Uh, a, a better way for us to understand it today would be, "But when you're restored." Now, what do you restore? Something that's broke. You 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 don't restore a new car. You restore a an old car, right? And so he looks at Peter and says, "But when you are." restored. And so when he says, Peter, you're going to need restoring, what's he saying to Peter? Peter, you're going to fail. Not when, not if, but when. I've prayed for you, Peter, that when you fail, you won't be utterly destroyed. Not the answer I'd have been looking for. I've got to be honest. Yeah, not, yeah I, I, I like my answer much better, but I punched him in the throat. I, you know, I, I like my response. My, I built a wall around you and he can't get to you. No, that's not what he says. He says, Peter, you're going to fail. And in a moment, he's going to spell it out. Peter, here's how. You're going to deny me three times. You're going to deny you know me. But I've prayed, Peter, that when that happens, you won't be utterly destroyed. And when you are restored, when you are restored, now notice that. Again, little words in this passage. Not if you're restored, but when you're restored. Peter, you're going to fail, but you will be restored. Now let's think about that word converted or restored for a moment. 
Have you ever seen an old car restore itself? What happens if you leave an old car alone? It gets worse. So if, if you see a, a 55 Chevrolet going down the road and it's got a bright, shiny paint job and all nice interior and everything, what do you know? You know that somewhere there's a restorer, right? Peter, when you are restored, when you are converted, not something you're going to do on your own. Peter, you're going to fail. And I'm going to pray that you don't become utterly against God, turn against your faith, because I am going to pick you up. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to lift you up. I want you to know something this morning. I don't know where you fell from or where you've fallen to. But I know that my God still restores. Amen. Satan will tell you you're useless. I had a guy that worked for me who brought me some pictures one time of an old, he told me it was a car. I would have given you good odds it wasn't. It looked like 14 pounds of rust to me. He brought it and he had it in his garage and he said, look at my car. And I'm like, well, get that junk out of the way so I can see it. And it took him a while. Matter of fact, it was after I'd left and after I was here, one evening, I was out here, and he pulls up in the parking lot, and he says, here it is. I finally finished it. I don't know how far you've fallen, but I know that God still puts it back together. No matter how bad you may feel, no matter what you may think, no, what, no matter what Satan may be sitting on your shoulder and telling you how useless you are, how, how, how no count you are, God still restores. Satan may desire to destroy you. God desires to restore you. Why? Look what he says to, to Simon. Not only do we have the work of Satan and the word for Simon, but I want you to see finally in the last, it's the warning for servants. When you have been restored, Simon, strengthen thy brethren. If I could tell believers, followers of Jesus Christ, one thing, I'd give them these three words. Strengthen thy brethren. Strengthen thy brethren. I would encourage you, if I had my way, we'd write that on the covers of our Bible where we wear the what would Jesus do bracelets. We'd wear uh, STB bracelets. Strengthen thy brethren because that's what Jesus would do. That's what he would do. That's what he would have us to do. Unfortunately, as Vance Havner says, he said, he, Vance Havner said, he's, he's passed, Vance Havner said, Christians are the only people in the world that shoot their wounded. Jesus says to Simon, Simon, Satan wants to destroy you. Satan wants to torture you. Satan wants to punish you. He wants to take, he knows you. He wants to take your weaknesses and turn them against you. And Simon, you're going to fall. But I love you enough that one day I'm going to reach down and I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to restore you. And then I want you to go out and I want you to do the very same thing. Pick up a fallen brother and put him back. Strengthen thy brethren. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. We read what happens here with Simon Peter. We know how in a moment he's going to stand <coughs> outside Pilate's hall and deny he ever knew Jesus Christ, deny him three times, run off into the darkness crying. Uh, in, in a few days he's going to be sitting on the seashore uh, with Jesus eating fish. And in a few chapters we're going to read how he stands up at Pentecost and preaches one of the greatest messages ever preached. You know what I believe was happening? I believe Simon had been restored and he was strengthening the brethren. The Bible doesn't record it for me. But I got to believe there were more than, more than once, more than one opportunity when Simon sat down with another pastor, another believer, 
a friend who was struggling, who was questioning whether they should keep on keeping on, who was questioning their relationship with God, who was questioning whether God really loved them. And I got to think more than once, Peter sat down beside of them, got right up next to them and put his arm around their neck and said, let me tell you a story. I knew a guy one time who Jesus told him, you're going to fail me. Didn't just tell him he was going to fail him, told him how he was going to fail him, told him how many times he was going to fail him. And this guy was arrogant and said, not me, I'd never do that. And within a matter of moments was doing just exactly what Christ had told him. Oh, that guy felt like God could never love him again, could never use him again, could never do anything with him. He ran off into the darkness. A few days later, him and Christ had a long talk. And since that time, God's used him in a special way. God's used him to preach the gospel. Thousands have come to know Jesus because of that, that, change, that man's changed life. And I can hear that young man sitting there, well, well who is it, Peter? And Peter said, it's me. It's me. It's me. Don't give up because he never gives up on you. Go read 1 Peter. You know where we have that passage that says, Satan's roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour? You know who wrote that? Peter. Go read Peter's writings. See how many times he talks about being careful of Satan, being wary of Satan, watching out for Satan. You could say in many ways that's one of Peter's themes as he writes. Strengthening the brethren. See, there's a couple of groups of people here this morning. There are some of you here who are sitting here who are feeling, you know, the old proverbial, you can sit on a curb and dangle your feet. That's how low you feel. You feel like there's no way God could use you, no way God could love you. When you are restored, strengthen the brethren. I'm going to tell you something. If he would reach down and pick up Peter, do you understand when you read the text, the Bible says that Peter denied Christ within eyesight of Christ? That's what it says. It says Jesus looked up and saw him. They were within eyesight. Within hours of being told you'll deny Christ, Peter does just that. And yet Peter ends up being the the leader of the New Testament church. This morning you fail. What do you do? You get up and you carry on and you strengthen the brethren. You're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior. You're sitting here thinking, God could never love me. He could never save me. The Bible says He shed His blood for whosoever will. Just for you. There are others sitting here this morning who when you look back over your life, you see all the peaks and valleys. You see all the times you stumbled, all the times you failed. Can I encourage you to strengthen the brethren? We live in a hard time. We live in a hard world. People are mean. People are cruel. People are ugly. People are nasty. What we need in the church are believers, followers of Jesus Christ who are willing to come along and put their arm around somebody's neck and say, let me help you. Let me help you. More importantly, what we need are some believers who will lean down and say, let me help you up. Strengthen the brethren. I want to ask you to bow your heads as our musicians come this morning. Can I invite you this morning, if you're here today and you're a believer, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a Christian. Can I invite you to come to this altar this morning and kneel and say, Lord, give me a name. Give me a face. It may not even be somebody you know. It may be somebody at the 
service station where you buy gas, the grocery store while you, where you buy your groceries. I don't know their name, but I see their face. God, help me to be one that strengthens the brethren. Not asking you to change the world. I'm saying that we come and we kneel and we pray and say, Lord, give me one name. Give me one face, one person that this week I can help. I can be an encouragement to. They're struggling. They're, they're stumbling along. They're having trouble in their faith. God, just give me one name. Just put one on my heart. Show them to me. Maybe they're in your family. Show them to me, Lord. Give me the right words that I can strengthen the brethren. You're here today and you're that one that's failed. You're feeling like Peter right now. What in the world do I do? What in the world? God can't love me. Jesus says, I've prayed for you, that when you're restored. Not if you're restored, but when you're restored. You need to come this morning and say, Lord, lift me up. You lift me up, I'll lift others up. But most important, you're here today and you don't know Christ. You've never asked Him into your heart. God does love you. God does care for you. God will save you as we stand together. Mm -hmm.